I'm going to begin recording this presentation. My name is Gaylene Kinsey, and I am the host of this evening's virtual lecture by White Mountain Research Center. I'm the scheduling coordinator there. Um, I would first like to start off by giving a land acknowledgement by UC WMRC acknowledges the Numu, Paiute, and Newe Shoshone as the first peoples and traditional land stewards of Paihunadu and Coho, the Owens Valley and White Mountains. As a facility managed by a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Muadubu, elders, Humu, relations of past, present, and emerging. Okay, I'm gonna let one more person in. Okay, good to go. So our presenter this evening is Dan Southall, and he is a PhD candidate in physics with a special fo focus on experimental astrophysics at the University of Chicago. And the title of his talk this evening is Searching for Cosmic Particles Using the Beacon Radio Experiment at Barcroft Field Station. And we will have a question and answer session after his presentation. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat feature. I will moderate that section of the presentation by asking Dan the questions in the chat. Okay, uh, am I good to go? Yep, you're good to go, all ready to go. Great, let me try and restart my timer here. Um, so, hi, my name is Dan Salhall. Uh, as, I, as she said, I'm a graduate student at the University of Chicago, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about an experiment that we have installed at uh, Barkoff Field Station in California. Um, there's kind of a lot to cover here. Uh, my assumption is that not everybody is super familiar with uh, astronomy going into this talk, so um, I'm going to introduce Beacon real briefly at the beginning, just so you have a picture of maybe what it is in your mind, um, but then I'm going to try and kind of back up and talk about astronomy in general, um, talking, talking hopefully from a perspective where maybe you've you've learned about it before through optical astronomy like light and stuff. Um, then I'm going to talk about sort of uh, what we call multi-messenger astronomy, which is the next generation of astronomy where you're looking at things beyond light um, to understand the universe. And finally, I'm going to sort of transition back to Beacon uh, and talk about the specifics of Beacon, such as our design goals, um, the sort of physics and uh, technology around our, our radio experiment and uh, some of the trials and tribulations of working at high altitude. And then I'm going to show you some some examples of data that we have. Um, so. Uh, so I guess the elevator pitch for Beacon is that it is a high elevation radio astronomy experiment that searches for cosmic rays and neutrinos. Um, we're more designed to look for neutrinos, um, but we believe we are sensitive to cosmic rays as well. Um, I'll get into what each of those are, but for now you can just think of them as, as you know, physics particles. They're, they're interesting things to look at and they tell you about the universe. Um, our array consists of four cross dipole um, antennas that we put on the mountainside. We can use those to point at where we see radio signals coming at our array. Um, and we've been, we got a prototype installed at Barcroft Field Station in California for uh, about four years now. Um, we hope to understand the limits of the universe. Uh, we're specifically looking for particles that are at the highest energy um, observable. We could never create these on Earth. Um, so these ultra high energy particles. Um, so that's kind of the goal. As I said, uh, we're located at Barcroft Field Station. So here's, you know, continental US. You can see where I'm currently sitting at the University of Chicago. Um, and if we, excuse me, if we zip on over to the West Coast here, hopefully it's, it is playing. Um, you can kind of get a sense. I put some landmark cities there. This is Bishop. This is the sort of closest town to where we uh, we are situated. So you can drive into this sort of small town. It's it's really gorgeous. I recommend you visit. Um, this is where we pick up our supplies, head up the mountain. Um, if you want to actually get to our site, it's actually quite the drive from here, even though this is the closest sort of town to uh, where we live. Um, so 
we're on top of a mountain and the only way to access it is through sort of a quite an extensive mountain drive. Um, you have to kind of enter from the south side of this white mountain range and then drive across the entire ridge. So uh, despite the point to point maybe not being super far, it, it takes an incredible uh, amount of time to get up the mountain. Um, I'll talk more about maybe that later. Uh, so zooming in just to get a sense of the actual Barcroft Field Station, um, it is, you know, here's here's kind of what it looks like from above. Uh, it's it's a pretty old uh, style science, um, I don't know, base, I guess. It's where we sleep when we are installing experiment. But the experiment itself is actually a bit of a hike up the mountain uh, near this observatory dome right here, which I'm trying to highlight right there. Um, and I've put sort of markers for the four antennas that I mentioned uh, sort of on the hillside beside it. So you get a sense of where they're located. The array is designed so that it looks east, sort of out to the uh, Dyer Valley over in Nevada. Uh, OK, so here's here's an example of sort of what the view looks like uh, with uh, Step Whistle and Andrew Ziola uh, hiking up, uh, down the mountain with some of our equipment. Um, this is a high altitude site, as I mentioned. So uh, it, working here is very exhausting. You're kind of working at 13,000 feet or so. So you definitely, this is the sort of location where they do altitude sickness studies, and that can definitely affect your ability to both think and uh, you know physically maneuver. Um, this prototype site has been excellent for us, though. It's it's. Uh, uh, I'll mention hopefully in better detail why high elevation is so important, but for the you know, most basic perspective, it's that we see more stuff. We're looking at a larger portion of the horizon where we think we can see these particles coming from. Um, we've also had great support. You know, the White Mountain Research uh, State Center staff have been excellent, um, really, really fun people to work with. Uh, and when we first were trying to choose the site, we also found that at least on the continental US uh, scale of things, it's a relatively radio quiet environment, um, which is important so you don't have a lot of noise in your experiment. Uh, this is the sort of schematic overview of our experiment and how it might work. Um, so this is with the prototype layout on the mountainside here. Uh, we have four antennas that are sort of separated by roughly the size of half of a football field is how they're spread out. Um, and we look for mainly where our goal is to look for these tau neutrinos, which uh, exit the Earth's crust and kind of create a, a particle shower, which creates radio waves, which we can detect with our antennas. And the antennas are just, you know, they're, they're dipole antennas. They're um, you know, sensitive to television and things like that. They're, they're just normal antennas, but you can do really cool physics with them. Um, this upgoing signal with the tau neutrino is not our only signal, though. We also look for downgoing signals, which are these cosmic rays, which look very similar, but they're kind of coming directly from space rather than uh, the Earth here. Um, so that's Beacon very briefly. Um, I'm sure a lot of it didn't necessarily make sense, but I'm hoping to then, as I said, back off here and talk about astronomy and then build up to uh, the justification for the design of Beacon. Um, so astronomy is this, you know, older than time science of looking up at the sky and trying to understand the universe. Um, the most common form of astronomy that you might have heard of is just optical astronomy or, or you know, looking at light. So light is a, a particle um, that we, we talk about a lot that comes in waves of different frequencies. Those frequencies are kind of different colors and and you can take pictures of the sky and understand, you know, for instance, looking at the Milky Way galaxy, you can understand where our position is in the galaxy or the universe. Um, and you can understand the physics of what produced that light. Um, so light is not necessarily just a, a simple thing to understand. You know, there's a lot you can learn from just light. Uh, light comes in multiple different frequencies and each frequency is kind of indicative of this, the physics that created that particle of light, that photon. Um, you can think about it, you know, if you're trying to find apples, you might look for a red light and you take a picture with something that's sensitive to red light and it's going to highlight apples. Um, you can kind of do that for different parts of the spectrum and look for things uh, throughout the universe. So, uh, you know, our experiment is focused on looking for radio waves, but um, there are experiments that look for microwaves, infrared, you know, you've heard about like UV and X-ray and gamma rays and of course all of the colors that we call the visible spectrum. Um, so here's just an example of how you could look at the same object, in this case, just the Milky Way, with multiple different frequencies of light and understand um, different components of the physics of what you're looking at. Um, so here at the top is the radio light, um, and this gives you a, a great view of sort of the center of the galaxy. Um, but if you look at optical, that's actually largely pretty dark. And the reason for that is that optical light, um, unlike radio light, kind of gets trapped by dust. You know, if you've ever 
been seen dust, it's harder to see farther through it. And there's a lot of dust in the galaxy. Um, but radio actually travels through dust pretty well. So, uh, you know, if you want to study dust, looking in optical is pretty good. If you want to study what's behind the dust, looking in radio is pretty good. Um, and you can do similar for, for X-ray or gamma rays, which are higher energy photons. Um, so you can see some objects are really, really loud in uh, a gamma ray where they might not be in other, in other frequencies of the spectrum. One of the most common examples of um, sort of a single, uh, maybe not a single frequency, but a single sort of uh, spectrum search is the cosmic microwave background, which looks for microwave signals. Um, this is a really cool result that is basically describing the nature of the universe when it was created. So when, you know, science, scientists believe that the universe came from sort of a Big Bang singularity where everything was kind of squished into the same space and time and then it all just expanded out. Um, when things are close like that, they kind of tend to become the same temperature. Um, and then when they expand, uh, the result is that there's this sort of underlying uh, just bath of photons that are always existing throughout the universe that are roughly the temperature, but kind of then stretched as the universe expanded of the universe at the, the beginning of the creation. So you can kind of take a picture of the universe um, as old as possible by looking for photons that are in this microwave frequency range. Um, so that's kind of optical astronomy, but as I mentioned, I want to get into um, what we're going to call multi-messenger astronomy. So um, photons are a particle, and as I've tried to communicate here, they are a messenger of information. They tell you um, what is happening about different, you know, phenomenon throughout the universe, and um, turns out they're not the only messenger, um, specific, or especially if you're looking at the highest energies where you might be talking about things like uh, active galactic nuclei, which are these super high, super massive black holes. Um, and if you have something that's that big, you know, you have a lot of gravity that's pulling stars and, and other black holes into it and whipping them around and you, you get these intense gravitational and you get these intense magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields. Um, and you get these objects that are capable of just slewing particles at insane energies uh, away from them. So, you know, black holes as, as these things that sort of, sort of sucks to things towards them, but uh, they're also really good at spitting things, kind of slingshotting them away from them and, and creating these environments that are right for uh, the production of other types of particles and, and uh, signals and messengers. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of the sort of common ones that are uh, part of this multi-messenger picture. Um, you know, we've had a very successful couple of centuries of optical astronomy, and now we're kind of on the cusp of, of understanding the universe through the lens of these other messengers. Um, so I've already kind of discuss, or discussed photons of uh, various wavelengths. I'm going to talk about gravitational waves, cosmic rays, and neutrinos. Um, so these latter two I've already mentioned. This is kind of the goal of Beacon, so you can keep your mind on those when they come up. Uh, but I will briefly cover gravitational waves as well. Um, so this is gravitational waves in, uh, you know, maybe a single slide. Um, I'm not a gravitational wave physicist, so um, I'll leave that to them, but it's, it's really interesting if you want to look it up. Uh, LIGO is a successful experiment that has detected gravitational waves, which are basically waves in the gravitational field um, that travel throughout the universe after these catacly cataclysmic, oh my gosh, <laughs> out of these huge uh, mergers of things like neutron stars and black holes. Um, as, they, as they come towards each other, they spiral around each other as this, this diagram is trying to communicate and they send waves of gravity away from them. These are extremely hard to detect waves, um, but it turns out that if you send lasers down a hallway in very, very precise ways, you can measure uh, time differences when those lasers kind of arrive back at the original source. And uh, if they differ, then that's an indication that the Earth around those lasers has shifted or the gra gravity around those lasers has shifted um, and rippled based on one of these gravitational waves passing across the experiment. Um, so it's a very, very cool um, field of research that's been highly successful in the last 10 years. Um, so here's a fun animation of uh, maybe an active galactic nuclei. Um, artist interpretation, as a lot of uh, astronomy pictures are, um, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. But it, it communicates the idea of what I was describing earlier with these active galactic nuclei, which are um, their ability to just pump out and, and shoot particles uh, at insane energies. Um, and there's kind of a, a wide variety of particles they can spit out, but often we refer to most of them as, as cosmic rays, which is just to say they're 
things that shoot through space and they're cosmic like um so uh the most common cosmic ray is just a proton which um if you remember you know chemistry is is one of the sort of fundamental particles that makes up the nucleus of atoms so in chemistry you have protons and electrons kind of dominate a lot of uh, what is going on um pause that real quick um so protons, because they're a charged particle, can be accelerated by these these jets of uh, of uh, electromagnetic fields near these active galactic nuclei, and they can be sort of sent across the universe with incredible energies, and they basically move at the speed of light as they do so. Um, so yeah, they're not the only thing. You can also have heavier particles, where we theorize things like um, uh, you know stripped iron atoms can also be accelerated and things like that. So. Uh, but the general story is that these AGNs, these active galactic nuclei, kind of serve as like pitching machines within the universe. Um, so let me see if I can get to the next slide here. So here's kind of just a rough schematic of what that looks like for astronomy purposes. Um, you have the sky, you have stuff going on, and you have some distant source, which is a highly representative um, black hole here, shooting out particles across the galaxy and across the universe. Um, the thing about cosmic rays that is uh, kind of, you know, it can be a little frustrating for astronomy is that they, they are charged usually and they are, um, they interact with the electromagnetic forces. Um, so what that means is, like I was saying earlier, how uh, optical light might get absorbed by dust, cosmic rays might kind of deflect and bounce around through dust. Um, they're mostly, it's, it's, not, it's mostly minimized, but um, it can be a problem. And what that means is that sometimes if you see a cosmic ray hit the Earth and you have some detector ray that's designed to detect that, if you kind of think of where it's coming from and you draw that straight line out, it might actually deviate slightly from where it actually came from. Um, so that's just one downside to, the, to cosmic ray astronomy, but um, yeah, it's still really cool research. So here's a, a fun um, sort of way to get your mind around what a cosmic ray interaction looks like as it hits the Earth. So it's a really highly charged particle, and as it comes into the atmosphere, it basically hits nuclei and atoms in the atmosphere, just normal air molecules. And what happens is this sort of uh, you know epic sloughing of particles that are generated by the energy dissipating. So if you've ever seen you know a bullet go into a ballistic gel and it kind of reverberating, it's it's like that, but on a, on insane scales. Um, for for scale here, you know this is this is a small. Uh, I'm not sure if my mouse is visible, so I'll try and do the laser pointer. Oops, I played it again. This is Geneva here, like a kind of overhead view. Um, I ripped this from somebody in Chicago, so uh, I, I don't know why it's Geneva. I'm sure that's where they presented it the first time. Um, but that gives you a sense of how large these interactions can be. Um, but you know, for just to bring it back to Beacon real quick, the the nice thing about these large interactions is that they uh, are creating a bunch of charged particles, and those charged particles interact with the electric field and, and often do so in such a way where they emit light, which makes them pretty easy to detect, um, challenging to detect, but possible to detect. Um, so detecting those particles, you know, you're not actually, sometimes you are, but you're, oftentimes you're not actually detecting the particle itself. You're detecting something that the particle has, has um, generated as it's hit the Earth. Um, so that's kind of like detecting a boat going by by ripples hitting the shore rather than, you know, actually seeing the boat. Um, but you can still get a pretty good sense about the actual nature of the boat. The past, you know, if you get really big wakes, you can get a sense of the energy of it. Um, you can get a sense of the direction that it was going and things like that. Um, so I, I kind of hand waved the um, production of the electromagnetic magnetic waves that uh, we see, which are these radio waves, these photons. Um, for, I guess, slightly more specific names for them, the radio signals that we talk about are produced through what's called the Iskarian effect, which is like the Cherenkov light, if you've ever heard of Cherenkov radiation, um, which is generated when particles go faster than the speed of light in the medium they're in. So not actually faster than the speed of light, but light moves slightly slower through air. So if something's going at basically the speed of light through air, it can create uh, radiation like that. And it turns out um, what differs for the Iskarian effect is that if the uh, Cherenkov, or if what induces the Cherenkov light is at sufficiently high energies, the radio waves that are, or the waves of light that are produced can coherently add at the radio frequencies. Um, so that's kind of in the weeds, but basically we get radio light as particles uh, hit through the atmosphere. Um, similarly, we also get geomagnetic radiation, which is basically um, charged particles 
moving around in the magnetic field of the earth and that can create sort of a, a voltages in, uh, is one way to put it uh, in the atmosphere which then also produces these uh, electromagnetic waves that we can detect. Um, so hopefully that wasn't too much in the weeds but I'm going to get a little more in the weeds here because I'm going to want to talk about neutrinos. Um, cosmic rays have a touch point in that they are something you might have heard about you know they're, they're, they're oftentimes protons or just nuclei of, of iron atoms or similar. Neutrinos are a little harder to talk about, um, but I, hopefully I can uh, describe them in a way that is, is somewhat um, uh, helpful to get a picture in your head. Um, so these are basically just particles. They're, they're a, a thing that is in the universe and we observe it and we understand it and the properties of it. Um, one of the main properties of it is that it's very fast um, and they're very light. So they move at basically the speed of light at all times, um, which is rare. Most particles don't tend to do that. Um, and they also have flavors. So there's kind of three different kinds of them, the uh, electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. Um, they're more similar than they're different, but they do have differences. Um, and it turns out they can kind of turn into each other as well, um, which is something that uh, I'm not going to go too much into. Um, so this table on the right here is, is a lot of things. You can see photon here. Um, you can see electrons. So hopefully there's some things that are familiar in the table. You can think of this as kind of the periodic table of elements, but for physics. Um, yeah. So one thing that is interesting about neutrinos, uh, uh, at what point did I mute? Hopefully I'm, that was That was recently. an accident, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, hopefully I, you didn't miss anything. Um, so the, uh, the interesting thing about neutrinos is that they are um, very, elusive you know we often refer to them as ghost particles they don't uh interact with the electromagnetic force in, which is how we kind of most of what you interact with in the, the world is through the electromagnetic force you know that's that's what's binding molecules together for instance um so not interacting with that kind of means that they don't see the electrons they don't see the charges of particles um, they only see through the weak force. Um, so in physics, there's four fundamental forces we talk about. There's gravity, there's electromagnetism, there's the strong force, and there's the aptly named weak force. Um, so if something only interacts through the weak force, uh, you know, it, it's, it makes it something that's hard to see. Um, the weak force most often comes up in, in nuclear interactions, so within the nuclei of atoms. Um, so what that means is that what you know, something like cosmic ray might see is as a, a solid chunk of atoms, like a brick of atoms here. Um, because the neutrino doesn't see the electrons, which are the vast majority of the volume of atoms, um, it kind of sees a, a much a much tighter knit um, array of, of, or sorry, not much tighter knit, uh, a much uh, looser knit um, array of, of nuclei. So it actually has less things to kind of bounce off of as it moves. Sorry, someone's unmuted here. Uh, there um yeah so so you know basically when when a cosmic ray comes by it sees a lot of stuff to hit and when a neutrino comes by based on how it interacts it doesn't see a lot of stuff to hit and just for sort of a, an astronomy perspective um there's two categories that we kind of often talk about uh neutrino or yeah neutrinos which is these astrophysical neutrinos and cosmogenic neutrinos um astrophysical basically means they're generated at the source at some at some you know uh, star or active galactic nuclei or something and cosmogenic is a sort of interesting kind of neutrino that's produced sort of based on um cosmic rays hitting photons in the universe which i'll, I'll talk about a bit here um so there's a lot on this slide i would ignore most of it but the point of um this slide is basically to communicate that neutrinos are very common um they wherever there's nuclear interactions going on they are being produced so if you have a nuclear reactor on earth you'll see a bunch of neutrinos coming out of it if you're well equipped enough um the sun is basically a, a big nuclear reaction going on um so if you think about from the initial merger of, of hydrogen atoms here going into to helium up to heavier metals like uh um, well, we call the metals in astronomy like lithium and stuff. Um, at basically every step of the way, you'll have these, which I've highlighted here, these neutrinos being produced. Um, so if you had a, a camera that was capable of seeing neutrinos and you look up at the sun, it's going to be very bright, whereas, uh, you know, a lot of other things maybe won't be. Um, 
And that's an example of an astrophysical neutrino. These neutrinos are actually much lower energy than Beacon kind of looks for. Um, stars are as, as cool and, and as um, insanely powerful as they are. They're nowhere near uh, the power of uh, something like an active galactic nuclei, which I've already described a fair bit here. Um, but there's a lot of interactions going on in those sources as well, and they emit neutrinos as well. So that's kind of where they come from for astrophysical. Uh, cosmogenic, on the other hand, they come from these pitching machines of active galactic nuclei where a cosmic ray is, is spat out. Uh, I mentioned earlier this, uh, the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, um, which is this kind of every, everywhere existing um, bath of microwave photons. Turns out that a cosmic ray can hit one of those photons and in doing so uh, through a, a series of reactions will produce um, some neutrinos. Um, so. If, if, uh, if you're looking for neutrinos, you're likely going to see, hopefully, uh, both of these sources here. So this is a schematic of that. Um, so that's kind of an overview of multi-messenger astronomy. Um, and just to recap kind of the, the whole picture, uh, the universe has a lot of information to give us, and it tells us it through uh, many different messengers. Uh, light has been the most successful for the last several hundred years, but um, you know, we're, we're really on a, a very interesting cusp moving forward with this multi-messenger astronomy. Um, so it's not, with multi-messenger astronomy, it's not just that we can detect, uh, you know, the same interaction with multiple different sources, but it's that we can kind of get it at the same time. So there have been events where we have actually seen gamma rays, which are really high energy photons, uh, hit the Earth the, at the same moment that we've seen gravitational waves hit the Earth, and they both pointed to the same location in the sky. So you can you can kind of combine those pieces of information to understand more about that interaction, and it's it's really exciting. Um, so uh, hopefully hopefully that justifies maybe where, uh, the place of Beacon a bit, but I'll I'll go move on from here now uh, a little bit. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that neutrino interactions are very rare. And I've also talked about how we are trying to have, uh, we're trying to make an experiment that is trying to detect them. Uh, so if something is very rare and you want to detect it, uh, that can be a challenge. Um, I mentioned that as a neutrino, you know, interacts, if it, if it does, it, it might hit a nuclei of an atom. And in doing so, it can produce one of these big particle showers and that can produce radio light. Um, so it's possible to see them. You know, if you see the radio light, you can, you can see a neutrino, but those interactions are still very rare. Um, so, the way that I like to think about it is if you're trying to design an experiment that is trying to detect something that's very rare, um, in physics, you know, well, I'll, I'll draw an analogy to uh, basketball. Um, if you're trying to sink a shot from really far away, the easiest way to increase your odds is to uh, increase the net to a grotesquely pixelated version of it um, and then take your shot on the bigger net because that will be much easier to uh, score. <laughs> um, so, wow. Um, so with physics, what we do is we take what would be, you know, maybe a reasonable size experiment and we try to make it as big as possible. Um, so even though there, each individual nucleus is very small and hard to interact with for a neutrino, if you get insane, you know, numbers of these neutrinos or of these uh, nuclei together, uh, you can increase your odds that the neutrino will eventually hit a nuclei and then create a shower that you can detect. Um, so how do you get a bunch of matter together for a detector? Um, well, the cheapest way is to go somewhere where there's already a bunch of matter. Um, and most commonly, uh, well, maybe not most commonly, but one of the, the biggest um, ways that we do this is go to glaciers. So glaciers are um, typically in very radio quiet or regions of the world, very quiet regions of the world, such as Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and if you can somehow put radio antennas in a way where you can view, look for these neutrino interactions, um, the ice provides this huge body of particles that uh, hopefully increase your odds of seeing them. Uh, one of the benefits about ice is that it's actually also um, radio transparent, so, uh, well, mostly, so radio light can travel through it uh, for, you know, kilometers, whereas through something like rock or something, it, it, it can't as much. Um, so, if you have the idea of you want to build a, a detector that basically turns a glacier into a, uh, a detector, you want to turn some or put some radio antennas nearby, um, there's kind of two main ways that we've done this, which is uh, burying antennas. So you, you drill a hole in the glacier and then you drop down some antennas 
um, which are sensitive to these radio waves, and then you look for radio waves in the ice. Uh, and that's what experiments like like RNOG do, um, which is one that we recently have installed in uh, Greenland or in the process of installing more stations every year. Um, but it turns out that there's also, uh, well, and if you do that, actually, then, you know, that's, that's one way to build an experiment. Um, another way to build an experiment is to put radio antennas on a balloon and fly it over the ice. Um, this is what Pueo does, and in the past, Anita has done. So two uh, experiments that basically fly 40 kilometers over the ice on a, on a NASA-funded balloon, and they look for radio pulses that are coming up from the ice in these remote uh, you know, Antarctic environments. Um, it turns out that uh, for these above-horizon experiments, such as uh, uh, Anita, there's kind of a second way that you can actually get a signal. Um, so it's not just these neutrinos coming in and hitting the ice and creating the shower. Um, there's a second way where specifically only with the tau neutrino, so I mentioned there's multiple flavors. If you're looking at just the tau neutrino, um, instead of creating one of these showers, one of the things it can do is create a tau lepton, which is a, a particle that's kind of like an electron and is associated with the neutrino. Um, and it's possible for that tau lepton to be created in the ice, escape the ice, and then hit the atmosphere in the same way as I was describing with a cosmic ray. Um, and it'll create a shower that's kind of going upward and that's also detectable through radio light. Um, so if you design one of these experiments, you can look for both types of signals. Um, another way that you might want to get a lot of matter in one place is to look at mountains, you know, rock and earth. That's a lot of matter. Uh, I already mentioned kind of one of the biggest flaws for that is that um, the radio waves don't travel through rock very well. So if you had antennas in rock, you're not going to see anything, even if there are a lot of neutrino interactions going on. Um, you're not actually seeing a lot of the rock. You're only seeing the closest rock to you. Um, so think about losing your radio signal as you go through a tunnel or something. Um, but it turns out that this this sort of uh, side channel here of just the tau neutrino uh, creating a tau lepton, which creates the shower, that still works because the actual radio pulse is being generated in the atmosphere above the Earth, not in the Earth. Um, so it still travels fine through the air, and you can detect it. Um, so... You go where there's a lot of rock. Uh, I don't intend on this picture to really show uh, where we actually have the experiment because I've already described Beacon, which is uh, in California. Um, but this gives a sense of, of um, the idea. You go where there's a bunch of rock, maybe mountains or something where you can look down at the Earth's crust and use the Earth itself as your sort of detector. Um, and you look for these radio pulses and you can put antennas on the mountain and then you can put grad students on the mountain and then you can make an experiment around that. Um, so that's that's the idea, back to this kind of similar slide I mentioned earlier of sort of the elevator pitch at Beacon, and then hopefully now I've, I've built up the foundation a little more to understand um, uh, the idea. Um, so Beacon is specifically sensitive to these tau neutrinos. Um, we look for tau neutrinos that are generated by tau leptons which escape the Earth's crust, and they create these air showers which create radio signals which hopefully will be detected by our array. Um, as I mentioned, though, we are also sensitive to cosmic rays, which are another very interesting astronomical source. Um, the benefit of a high elevation site, you know, we are two kilometers basically prominence above the, the valley uh, to our east, um, is that we see more matter. So, you know, this, these, these designing experiments is basically always around trying to maximize your detector volume. And the higher you are, the more Earth's crust you see, the more matter you see, the more likely you are to see a neutrino interact. Um, a full-scale beacon uh, would hopefully be bigger than the prototype that currently exists, and you know we think that a, a, a station would consist of 10 antennas with sort of maybe three outlying antennas, which helped with uh, determining the location of uh, where the interaction happened. Um, so here's an idea of what the, the view looks like. Um, so this is just, just a short walk from where the antennas actually are. Um, and you know we're in California, so if you're looking with your eyes, uh, often there will be some haze from from uh, forest fires, unfortunately. But um, the radio can still see through most of that, and it can see very far, and it can see basically all of this area here is just detectable area for us. Um, here's a, a fun plot that we've made. Um, when you are doing physics, one of the most important things to do is to understand your experiment uh, such that you can motivate the design of it and justify it for funding agencies and things like that to make sure that you are building the best possible thing. Um, so oftentimes what that means is that you build simulations of your experiment and you basically try and do the experiment before you can do the experiment. 
Um, so here's here's one thing where we're just trying to map out the uh, viewable area that Beacon sees. So at any given instant, you know, you see the horizon and really you're seeing the space that is behind that. Um, and that kind of looks like this projected onto you know, a square version of everything of looking outward. Um, and because the Earth rotates and we're, we're, you know, on the side of it, our view rotates with the Earth and that kind of scans across and you get this whole sort of sensitivity region. Um, so this is like the viewing, the viewing angle sensitivity of a single beacon station, but the idea of a full scale beacon would be to have multiple different beacon stations at different mountain ranges. So maybe you had one in Chile or something like that, and then you can get sensitivity in, this, in the southern hemisphere. Um, so you can kind of build upward from there. Uh, I don't want to go too much into detail of this plot because I think it's kind of over the, the goal of, of what I'm trying to communicate here. But um, as I said, we build these simulations and they're, they're really interesting, sophisticated uh, bits of code that uh, simulate the physics of what's going on. And um, using that, we think that with uh, 100 stations, uh, we with three years of data with Beacon, we think we could be competitive with the current sort of estimates of, of rates of the particles as they're produced in the universe. We think we would hopefully start seeing them. And uh, with a thousand stations, we would um, be really pushing against the, the uh, most conservative models uh, that exist. Um, so these, these particles are generated, you know, we've seen really high energy cosmic rays and, and those tell us that there should be high energy neutrinos, but um, the reality is they're still very rare. So, so a lot of these experiments are basically trying to make sure that we detect them uh, and uh, this plot is trying to communicate that we're very confident that a, a large scale beacon array would be capable of detecting um, them. So uh, simulations are great, but uh, you always need to build something. And uh, to really understand the system, uh, we have installed for the last four years a, a beacon prototype, which is uh, a, an array of just the four cross dipole antennas um, that we have put at Barcroft Field Station. Um, which I've already described, you know, most of this already. Uh, the prototype allows us to test the hardware of the system and also, you know, the software, the coding, and really just run the system in a bare bare bones form and uh, hopefully motivate and um, find all of the bugs to find. Um, with with the scale of the prototype, we don't expect to be particularly sensitive to actually neutrinos. They are still incredibly rare, and you would hope that with you know many many uh, arrays you could find them. Um, but for now, our goals are mostly set on trying to see cosmic rays, which, uh, as I said, are a very similar signal, uh, and we think will test our capabilities, but are much more common to see. Um, to give you a better idea of the scale of the prototype, I already mentioned that it's roughly the size of half of a football field. Um, so it that's true but it is also diagonal on a, on a mountainside that is very rocky um so here's a picture of the antennas installed um for for scale reference this this blue water bottle here is this blue water bottle here um so each mast is about 12 feet tall or 3.6 meters or so um so again you can kind of see even though they're spread out by the size of a football field you can still see them they're um but uh that gives you also a sense of the boulders that we're climbing over. This is a very, very rocky terrain. Speaking of the water bottle, I'm going to take a drink real quick. Okay, so um, if you want to build a big experiment with many antennas, many arrays, uh, one of the most important things is to make sure that it's cheap and make sure that it's functional. Um, so we have been using a lot of custom uh, hardware. So we've made our own dipole antennas. Uh, those readout signals, they're amplified on, on board on the antennas. Those read out uh, the waveforms through cables that run up to an observatory dome that's uphill. You can see me standing by it, watching everybody else work really hard. Um, and uh, those signals are then read into sort of a, a custom DAC, which I'll talk about later, which is a data acquisition system. Um, the antennas are exposed they're out in open air you know as i showed you them on the side of a mountain um we go there at the most pleasant time of the year when it is very cold and windy um and when it is not so pleasant it gets very very cold and extremely windy um so uh, the mountain has found interesting ways to destroy our experiment <laughs> uh, every year and we find interesting ways to combat that um so I, did, I, you know, I'm not going to go too much in the details of it, but every year we find new ways to fix problems that the the uh, environment has has um, besought upon us. So whether that's you know 
uh, removing strain from certain components such that you don't have uh, capacitors popping off of boards or whether it's it's insulating your your uh, enclosure better um, adding more guy lines is a is a very common example one of the most fi uh, common failure cases we've had is that these antenna masts have fallen over um, so we're, we're we're an experiment that's really trying to be uh, you know very careful about the environment that we are on top of um, so we are not allowed to do any drilling or anything like that. And if you've ever tried to keep something upright, uh, you know, one of the easiest and most common ways to do that is to have a foundation where you dig down um, and either put guy lines from those foundational elements or uh, similar. Um, we can't do that and we, we don't want to do that. So uh, instead, we have to try and uh, keep these masks upright with things like more conventional, such as uh, wooden struts, which basically stick out from the antenna and are wedged into uh, rocks. The nice thing about the rocks is that they're extremely heavy and do not move. Um, so if you tie some rope around it, that can hopefully uh, keep your antennas upright. Um, we're not only combating the elements on our way or on our on the mountain itself when we're installing antennas, but we are often combating them on our way to the mountain. Um, so I mentioned that very long drive that goes up the hill or up the mountain. Um, that is <laughs> sometimes a risk in its own. So this is um, where I learned to change a tire for the first time was uh, 10 feet from a sign saying, be careful because you might uh, pop your tire. So felt like a, a very appropriate sign. Um, and, you know, so that's one of the things you need to prepare for. Uh, Working at altitude also, you know, there's no hardware stores nearby. You need to be uh, prepared. You need to bring all of the equipment that you're going to need to use. You're going to need to bring food. You know, we sleep at Barcroft. Usually we go for about a week at a time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really a, a nice endeavor for planning. Um, but there's many challenges. So, so for instance, we're running a physics experiment where we have a lot of power demands. We might need to be running laptops or oscilloscopes or pulse generators, things things that physicists like to play with. Um, we need to run them on a mountainside where there's no power. Um, so, you know, that might mean we're carrying around 100 pound car batteries or in more recent iterations, um, nice compact camping batteries. Um, all of this is being done at, again, high elevation, which is extremely, extremely exhausting. Um, I've been at Barcroft a few times where they have been doing altitude sickness, um, and it's it's fun to see people who are basically like camping at the site. You know, their whole goal is to just exist and take medicine or a placebo, um, and to see how miserable they are, and then to wake up at 7 a.m. and hike a mile or two uh, <laughs> while I have to actually kind of carry heavy equipment, which um, you know I've I've mostly found uh, myself selecting all the slides where or all the pictures where I'm watching other people work, but you know that's the photographer's curse. Um, so you know as I also mentioned, this is another picture that communicates the terrain we're working over and we're carrying these antennas over this rocky terrain. Mm. So that's a lot of the, I don't know, uh, things you deal with working at Barcroft and at altitude. Um, but uh, it's also very beautiful. Um, so this is this is Andrew Ziola, who I spent uh, a lot of time working with this past summer where we were hiking around, sending radio signals at our array to understand the orientations of our antennas and where they're located and things like that um, for calibration purposes. And we probably spent maybe 24 hours total just sitting in silence on the mountainside with walkie-talkie communication to people back at Barcroft, uh, kind of just looking out and, and, and hanging out. Um, and it was cold, but it was it was uh, it was beautiful. Um, so that's a lot of nice pictures. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, physics. Hopefully, um, <laughs> you stick with me. Um, so we built an experiment that is based on radio arrays um, and looking at radio antennas that are looking for radio waves. Um, here's a very quick one slide interpretation with some nice uh, pulling figures from Wikipedia that are very helpful um, to describe how those radio waves are actually detected. Um, so a single antenna is basically just metal that is, you know, uh, sensitive. It has, it has electrons in it. And if something comes along that is an electric force or, you know, in our case, a radio wave, uh, that can move those electrons around and slosh them back and forth with the radio wave as this, as this diagram is attempting to show here. Um, and if you put electronics at the center of that, you can read out the current and the, the voltages of that oscillation. And that is how you um, sort of are seeing the radio wave. Um, if you then record that with, with electronics and amplify it and things like that, you can run some code to understand it even further. But that's the basics. Um, so that's a single antenna, but as I mentioned, we have four antennas at uh, Barcroft at, at the Beacon Prototype. So why do you have four antennas? Um, 
well, I'll try and explain that here. The reason is with one antenna, you can detect radio pulses, but you kind of just get a, a binary yes or no. There was a radio pulse. You don't get anything um, that tells you where it was coming from, really. Um, so if you add more antennas, what you can do is you can, um, here's an image of sort of, you can imagine this is a radio wave transmitting across our antenna array, and it will hit each antenna at a different time. So if you look at these two times, what can happen is that if the signal instead comes from a different direction, say from the right here, it will hit those antennas at slightly different times. Um, and from this orientation, basically at the same time, from that orientation, you know, it hit the orange one first. Um, and what you can do is you can basically map those different arrival times with directions of where these signals are coming from. And you can determine, basically map out where signals are coming from just based on these timings. Um, the problem is, uh, you know, with only two antennas, um, that signal can be degenerate. So I mentioned the signal coming from up here had hit this antenna and this antenna at precise timing, but it turns out that there's kind of a mirroring effect here where uh, a signal coming from here would hit those two antennas at the exact same timings. Um, so that's why we have more than two antennas. We have uh, actually four, and we hope to have 10 uh, plus on a full array. So if you have more antennas, you can kind of break that degeneracy where you get a third timing, which then gives you a slightly more unique um, uh, perspective. Uh, so our antennas tend to be on a plane, so three antennas is also kind of not enough, and you need, you need a fourth one. Um, but that's beside the point. So I mentioned how we get these signals. We actually have antennas that sort of detect these oscillations, these wiggles, and we record them. And then we have uh, four antennas. And each antenna is actually a, a cross dipole, which means that it's an antenna that is horizontally polarized and an antenna that is vertically polarized. So you're sensitive to light that is wiggling in the horizontal direction and light that's wiggling in the vertical direction. Um, so what that means is that we have eight actual readouts. Um, and we can use the arrival times of those eight readouts to understand where the radio light is coming when it hits our experiment. Um, this is an example of an event. So we trigger on impulsive radio events. Um, so the time scale here is in nanoseconds. Um, so, you know, a billionth of a second. Um, and the uh, signal comes in, it's a radio pulse and it kind of wiggles and we detect it. And we detect it at four separate points. So you know, these are the horizontally polarized antennas here, and these ones here are the vertically. Um, so this signal comes in, and it's mostly a horizontally polarized signal. And this is the horizontally polarized map, and you can see very clearly where the most likely direction this signal came in was, is at this sort of east 46 degrees north location here, just below the horizon. So this is zero degrees here. Um, this black kind of line here indicates where the slope of the mountain is. So below that, we don't expect to actually see signals. Um, so this is what our data looks like. Uh, and again, you can get the source direction of this signal. Um, in this case, I've chosen an event that is a background event from below the horizon. Um, so if you look at the array and you plot that trajectory off into the horizon, this is kind of what it looks like. And if you follow that further, this specific event, I I believe is most likely coming from this uh, Crescent Dune Solar Energy Project, which is about 70 miles from uh, the Markov site. Um, and you know, it's a it powers I think half of Nevada or something like that. So you can imagine uh, that this sort of power generation is creating radio waves, and uh, it's it's sensible that we see a lot of stuff coming from this direction. Um, we, of course, see signals coming from multiple directions. So this is kind of a, a histogram, if you're familiar with those, but it's basically a picture of where different signals are coming from. Um, so you can see different clusters, different hotspots where, say, there might be a town or, uh, you know, in this case, this is all of the power generation I just described. Um, and you can kind of say, for all of the events, where does it come from? Put it on this, on this map and you can see where things are coming from. Um, for the physics -y people, uh, with this you can also take single spots and you can calculate the angular resolution of our detector, which gives us a sense of how accurate we are, um, or how precise we are. Um, so with Beacon, with just the prototype alone, we're, we're already down to, you know, uh, square degree areas of, of about a fifth of a degree or so. Um, just very exciting. Um, so you don't get all that data without uh, some cool electronics. So we have uh, Eric Oberla, who's a postdoc with us, and he's spent a lot of time working with the system. Um, it actually comes from uh, sort of a, a lineage of one of the in-ice Antarctic exper experiments called ARA. Um, and it uses a uh, what's called a directional beam forming trigger, which I'll talk about on the next slide a little bit. 
Um, but our deck is basically a computer that takes the wiggles that we see in our cables and our, in our antennas and it turns them into data, which is then stored. Uh, timing information is included with it and it's all transmitted and sent back to Chicago where we can analyze it. So the beamforming trigger is, is one of the unique aspects of Beacon that's very cool. Um, I mentioned that you can use these timings to understand where signals are coming from. Um, you, it turns out you can do that kind of live as, as the waveforms come in. And what you can do is you can basically set a different trigger threshold for different areas of the sky. Um, and that allows you to identify something like this solar you know, power plant that we talked about and say, if a signal appears to be coming from that direction, don't record it. We don't want to see it. It's not a cosmic ray most likely. So raise the trigger threshold hit there. We're less sensitive in that direction. But now our system is seeing less from that direction. Our system is no longer busy processing events from that direction. And we're still able to keep receiving data from other directions. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, allows us to uh, increase our uh, sensitivity and decrease our trigger thresholds which is very cool. Um, I mentioned this, this example uh, here, but there is a lot else that we look out. As I said, we're in kind of a, a radio quiet environment looking out over Nevada, but we are still in America and there is still a lot of stuff. Um, so closest by, you know, there's farming crop circles here. Uh, if you go just over this mountain ridge here, there's there's towns and there's a lot of military activity. You know, Area 51 is is uh, just just out here in sight from us. Um, so we see a lot of a lot of you know basically stuff in our data, um, and a lot of the uh, work with Beacon is trying to figure out how to identify what is obvious background and remove it, such that all we have that is left is cosmic ray signals. Um, so here's some other examples of of noise that we deal with. Uh, as I mentioned, these antennas are are working in uh, the 30 to 80 megahertz range, which um, might not mean a ton to you, but if you've ever tuned into a radio station, those are usually 80 to 100 megahertz, you know, um, so uh, your car is sensitive in similar ways to Beacon. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it turns out that TV signals are also transmitted at, in this sort of range. So this is a, this is called a spectrogram, and it basically tells you the um, signal content as a function of time and we have this constant band here which is the tv signals um uh always kind of in the background sorry someone's unmuted here um so we see tv uh which is uh as entertaining as that is it's not actually very helpful for our experiment um we also see much more sort of temporally uh abrupt things so uh, we believe these little blips here are uh, basically radio communications for the la department of water which if you know anything about California, uh, kind of is everywhere. Um, so that's a lot of below horizon stuff. We do see backgrounds from above the horizon as well. Um, this is uh, just a couple of events that are I'm strung together into just a, an animation here to show an airplane going overhead. So we, we have data that is basically communicated, you know, airplanes transmit their location for obvious reasons. And you can access that data and say, were there any airplanes in the sky when we recorded this event? And in this case, there was an airplane that directly overlapped with each of these events. And you can, you can literally trace it going over ahead of us, which is, uh, it was really cool to find. Um, it is a background, so ultimately we want to remove it, but it also uh, validates our experiment in a lot of ways because it shows that we can trigger on events that are coming from above, and it shows that our pointing resolution is is pretty strong. We can actually point at these these airplanes that are flying overhead. Um, so ongoing is this cosmic ray search, which I've alluded to. Um, this is what I hope to turn into a PhD thesis. Um, it is not complete yet, so I can't give you any um, uh, conclusive results from it, but uh, it's it's basically a huge effort in which we take these signals, each signal has information in it from source direction to, uh, you know, signal properties like signal to noise ratio, um, you can just take standard deviations, max values, you can, you can ask how similar does this look to a simulated event, um, and you can combine all that data and try and reduce your data set. Um, so if you look at our Data, we have a lot of events um, because we have a lot of no a lot of noise mostly. 
Um, we don't suspect to have a lot of Cosmic Rays in there. We do suspect to have enough. Um, but we think our rates are roughly, you know, uh, one Cosmic Ray per day uh, to maybe one Cosmic Ray per month, somewhere in that range. Um, so in the same month of data where we might have a handful of Cosmic Rays, we, ex we have about, you know, 30 million events. And if you're talking about um, trying to process data from several months, we might have 100 million events that we're trying to uh, reduce down to uh, just a handful of Cosmic Ray events. So that's, that's ongoing. Um, and I can talk about that more, but um, eh, I think about it a lot all, all day, every day. So <laughs> um, I will move on to someone else's work very briefly. Um, I'm, I'm coming up on the end here, by the way. Uh, so this is, this is uh, another portion of the Cosmic Ray um, sort of understanding that we try and accumulate with Beacon. So as I said, if you build an experiment, a lot of the time you also build a simulation around the experiment. Um, and Andrew Ziola, who is a, a graduate student at Penn State University, has done excellent work working on uh, the very cleverly named Cranberry, which is a cosmic ray uh, experiment, or sorry, a cosmic ray simulation, which includes the physics of the air showers that I've shown that nice image of going over Geneva. It includes that physics, uh, the radio waves that are produced, how those then uh, travel through the air, hit our experiment. Um, he included basically these are showing the sensitivities of our antennas and our experiment. Um, so the, the radio waves are then processed in the code through that. And you can basically simulate the entire scenario and uh, get a sense of how sensitive the experiment is through something like this. Um, so we're still developing it. We're still trying to add all of the, the finer details. Um, but this is a, a super cool project. So if you're interested in that, you know, I'm sure he'd answer some questions. Um, I also mentioned that a full-scale beacon is uh, planned and would be uh, not just one station. It would it would be actually hopefully a hundred or a thousand would be kind of the the full scale. Um, and to get that many stations, you would need to spread it out over, and you would want to spread it out over uh, a large area. Um, so one of the big things about the prototype is not just to figure out how to. Uh, develop our system such that it works, but you also want to build it such that you can deploy it uh, in, a, in a sort of environment safe way that is is very easy to deploy um, in remote environments because that's where most of the mountains that you would want to deploy are. Um, so we've thought about different sites. Um, one of the things you want to do is you want to do what's called a site survey where you go out there with some antennas and you basically say, is this a good region to install a full array? You know, how, how much radio noise is going on here? Um, and some of the candidates, you know, there are sites similar to Beacon, though with less prominence of elevation uh, near Tucson and Salt Lake City. And then there's also this uh, pretty cool site up in up in Canada, which, by the way, I'm Canadian, um, which uh, is um, called Mars, which is the McGill Arctic Research Station, which has a mountain peak that I think you can fly to on helicopter um, that has similar prominences to Beacon and is much, much more um, uh, radio quiet. So that's kind of future thinking. Um, uh, I like this to end off because it's a bit of a walk into the sunset uh, slide for me. But um, that's that's mostly Beacon. Um, hopefully, hopefully by going through astronomy and the background, I was able to bring you up to um, you know the starting point of why we would even do Beacon, and then talk about Beacon and, and what's interesting about it. Um, we've got time for questions, so uh, if I didn't cover something, or if I only slightly covered something, and you have question, then feel free to shoot when we do. Um, here's thanks to the Beacon people. Um, so here's a few pictures. Uh, we don't often go all at once, so it's very hard to get a collaboration meeting, especially when our experiment has existed for four years and two and a half of those have been under uh, uh, quarantine uh, regulations. Um, but this is the best we have, and um, they're all fun people to work with. So thanks to them. And that's, uh, that's all. I thanks, Dan. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I wanted to point out another guest that we have with us this evening. Um, you may have noticed her in the chat. It's uh, Stephanie Whistle, and she is a professor of physics at Penn State University, and she also focuses on experimental particle astrophysics, and she is a contributor and colleague of Dan's on this project at Beacon. Uh -huh. Yeah, so she's she's been fielding a lot of the questions too in the chat. So um, Dan, I'm not sure if we just want to reiterate again. On yeah, the I mean she's she's definitely uh, more qualified than me in most accounts, but I, I can try my best to 
Um, uh, yeah. If I can jump in, I can also point out that we also have another colleague of ours, uh, Kelly Hughes, oh, that's who great. is an excellent colleague of ours. So, um, and Kaylee. also, of course, Dan Arditi thanked everybody at White Mountain Research Station, but certainly oh, all of this yeah. wouldn't 100% not be possible with the support of White Mountain. And especially Stephen, who like, you know, rebuilt awesome. all of our antennas <laughs> yeah. last year. I want to point out. Um, yes. So yeah, we want to thank everybody uh, for all the great work that you're doing for us and to help us out. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I, I want you to know that Stephen and I are rocking our beacon shirts this evening. And I apologize that you can't see him. <laughs> So, um, so I guess we could start with the questions in the chat, if you would like. We have about 25 minutes to do uh, Q&A, if you want, Dan. Yeah, I'll, I'll take whatever is given, I guess. Um, okay. I don't know, do you, do you want to walk me through them? or? Yeah, I can do that for you, so then you can just focus on discussing them. Um, the first one was from Ray Klein. And I think it was touched in your presentation about the difference between this project and um, the radio observatories in Big Pine. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll first say that I, I don't work on those experiments, so I, 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 I can't speak for everything they do. Um, but I would say the, the big difference is, is the target. Um, so they are like OVRO and, and LWA are, are the experiments I think you're talking about, um, which if you've ever driven through that area, there's these really awesome, huge uh, sort of radio telescopes that look much more similar to the um, one that I showed on my astronomy slide. Um, and those are mostly looking for uh, uh, radio waves that are coming from the source themselves. So, I, I, you know, they're, they're not produced in the secondary effect where a neutrino comes through and creates a radio wave or a cosmic ray comes through and creates a radio wave. Um, they're doing much more conventional astronomy with, with light. Um, so they're still trying to observe the universe and understand it, but uh, they're not looking at the same particles necessarily, uh, despite using the same technology to do their science. Um, yeah, that's that's probably the biggest difference, I would say. OK, um, we have one from Scott Gruber. Scott is one of our IT guys down at uh, UCLA in our um, IOES department, and he's really interested in all of this. Um, he asks, what information can we see, quote unquote, or learn about the universe from neutrino astronomy? say compared to the James Webb infrared or optical astronomy? Yeah, um, so uh, with multi-messenger, we're, we're, you know, we're not necessarily trying to compete with those in, in a direct way. We're trying to add to them and, and provide uh, additional information. Um, James Webb is another one that is, is a, sort of an optical experiment. Let me see if I can, I don't know what my backup slides are, but maybe if I stop sharing, I can look through them real quick. Um, let me see here. Do I have anything on this? Not, not really. Um, so the the biggest difference that I I think, or not the biggest difference, but uh, one thing that we kind of add is that we are looking at energies that are much higher than those other experiments tend to look at. Um, so if you're trying to understand the universe, you know you can understand the objects themselves. So you can look at uh, stars and, and see how the populations of stars exist and the, the sort of patterns there. Um, but you can also use the universe as sort of a, an experiment in itself, as, as something that produces things that are in extremes that uh, maybe you can't on Earth. So um, if, you, if you know much about physics, you might have heard of the Large Hadron Collider, which is you know, a, an experiment that slings particles around and, and, and uh, makes them collide with each other. And uh, you can understand the fundamental physics of those particles based on those interactions. Um, what our experiment is kind of neat for is that, uh, you know, we can look at particles that are being produced in these galactic nuclei. And we can learn about the galactic nuclei themselves, but we can also understand better the physics that produce those particles. So we can understand the fundamental nature of the universe at energies that um, we would never be able to test with something like the Large Hadron Collider because we can't produce things at the energies that are even you know, comparable to uh, uh, a black hole at the center of the universe, which is, you know, a million times heavier than, than what we're talking about here. Um, so so I, I think that's one of the things that we do 
or we hope to do differently than um, something like the James Webb Telescope, which does awesome science on its own, and then we hope to kind of work with them maybe in a multi messenger front. But um, we're also trying to hopefully use ours to test models about the production of these particles and the actual physics um, at these high energies. Okay. We're feeling we have a lot of questions. Um, so the next one is from Noli Baker the third and their question is, would this instrument be able to detect a supernova, not necessarily the direction, just that there's a sudden flux? Um, yeah, I think I think I think we would, uh, especially if it was close enough um, and high enough energy. Um, the we would not be probably detecting neutrinos from it. I don't think. I, I as far as I understand the, the physics of it, um, we're we're mostly sensitive neutrinos at, at higher energies than probably even a supernova produces. But I might be wrong on that. There there might be some overlap there. Um, but I think we would probably be sensitive to cosmic rays coming from them. I, I hope. Um, or at least a full scale beacon array would be maybe maybe our experiment is is um, as these things go, you know, if you build the full one, you're sensitive to more stuff. Um, uh, but with the prototype one, we're probably most sensitive to the most obvious stuff. So the really loudest particles. But I, I think it's it's definitely totally possible that um, the prototype would be able to see uh, cosmic rays and those cosmic rays are produced by things like um, uh, perhaps uh, supernova. Um, but I think I think something like that before we would ever say confidently that this was you know uh, coincident with a um, with a supernova we would probably want a larger uh, fuller array for that. Um, one of the things I didn't mention with the uh, uh, sort of future plans for the beacon prototype is we're we're currently trying to um, draft plans to get uh, particle detectors to accompany our antennas so that we can detect. Uh, you know, if you think about the the big shower of particles that were produced in that in that picture of Geneva, um, if you have detectors that are designed to detect those particles themselves, so not the radio waves, um, what what can happen is then you can kind of have a secondary signal where you see the radio wave, but then also you get a signal that says, okay, this was a radio wave and it was a radio wave that came with particles with it. So you can be more and more sure of the cosmic ray. Um, and that would be maybe something that would help us uh, achieve more confidence trying to say this this particular cosmic ray came from a uh, supernova. Um, but I think overall, like the, the goal of, of um, multi-messenger astronomy is, is trying to achieve exactly that. So you have something that is maybe a gamma ray burst from, from uh, from a supernova like that and you try and detect the neutrinos that come off of it with something like ice cube or aura or rnog or beacon okay speaking of ice cube scott is asking if you've ever been to ice cube in the antarctic uh, unfortunately not um basically everyone i know has in the field uh, um <laughs> i've i've uh, i've had the pleasure of uh going to beacon mostly <laughs> um i have worked with those experiments uh, mostly um, I designed uh, with so uh, Beak or uh, RNOG and and I or sorry Ice Cube kind of happened. Um, you know PhDs tend to be around five to six years, and and the the Ar Antarctica work was kind of finishing when I joined the research lab. But we recently started installing antennas in um, Greenland with this experiment called RNOG, and I designed the uh, horizontally polarized antennas for that experiment. So um, I think I showed the diagram there with the antennas dropping down the hole. Um, I had a part in that, but I haven't actually been on the ice myself, unfortunately. Um, that would be a cool experience. Um, one of the things I guess I, 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 I stole some slides from Steph, actually, um, which I might share real quick because they're really cool. Um, specifically talking about Anita, which is the above horizon um, experiment. Uh, so maybe I'll show those real quick just because it's brought up. Let me try that. So again, Anita, Anita is like Poeo. It's one of these above horizon experiments. Um, and it is, it is very pretty. Okay. Sorry. I'm got too many windows open now. Okay. Are you seeing the slides there? Okay. Um, so this is Anita flies over Antarctica, and um, it's had I think four successful flights so far. And uh, it flies forty kilometers over the horizon, or sorry, above the Earth, which is very high. Um, and it's a very big thing. So this is a crane here lifting it. You can kind of see the scale of it. And this is the the flight path of one of the the flights. Again, I stole this from Steph. I'm not an expert on Anita, but um, I'm sure she can answer some questions regarding it. Um, but this is kind of just a fun video of it taking off. 
um, and it gives you a sense of the scale of that experiment. So anyways, thought I'd show those because they're cool. Yeah, so the cool thing about Anita is that um, it's similar to Beacon in that we're basically looking for neutrino interactions in the Earth that then generate radio waves. Um, but it actually flies at an altitude that's 90,000 feet. So it's basically in space. So you're able to build up an even larger detector than you can do with Beacon. But the cool thing about Beacon is that you can wiggle, you, you can kind of like adjust the energy range over which you can observe these, these neutrinos. And so they're, they're complementary detectors in my mind. Right. Sorry to jump in there, Dan. No, that's okay. great. It's appreciated. So, um, so what about? Let's see. Ray's asking um, if there's interference from satellites, and then Noli had asked too if um, you know there's any problems with lightning strikes. Yeah, um, both both really good questions. Uh, the satellite question. Um, we don't have any knowledge of that so far uh, of, of seeing satellites uh, it's possible but they they would be very far away um, and even though radio does travel through the atmosphere um, they might be slightly attenuated um, i mentioned that we saw airplanes which is probably the closest and we can confirm that we've seen airplanes um, we don't actually think that the airplanes we see radio waves directly coming from them we think they might be reflected from signals on the ground that then bounce off of the uh, airplanes because we don't see every airplane certainly we only see them intermittently um so we think it kind of requires very specific geometry for, for an airplane to actually reflect one of those signals um and if it was a similar story with uh satellites i i, I think it would be pretty rare um but it is something that's worth noting i think I think some of the Antarctic experiments have tried to, uh, they, where they have way less noise, there's way less that they see in general, just because there's not much going on in Antarctica. I think they might have seen um, satellites before, but that's 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 a maybe. Um, uh, remind me of the other question again. What was it? It was oh, it was lightning strikes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we we don't have a way of confirming whether uh, lightning strikes have directly hit our experiment or not, because. Um, uh, we're on the side of a mountain where we're not constantly looking at it. Um, but we certainly have seen indications that there has been a uh, strong electrical current uh, going through our antennas before. Um, I mentioned some of the ways that they have died is through wind and stuff. Um, but I've definitely disassembled some of the uh, old antennas and found a lot of soot where, you know, some tines had kind of broken off based on, based on, it almost looked like it exploded. Um, so that's something that we, we think about. I, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily what happened. I think it was probably just wind and then some, maybe something shorted, but it's possible. Um, there's not really any way to confirm it as yet. Um, though we are thinking of installing webcam, which would hopefully uh, maybe get some really cool footage if that was the case. Um, it's not something we want. Uh, so ideally that is not a problem that we have. Um, we do think that we actually see lightning events. Um, they're not very impulsive because the, the sort of the time scale of um, radio is actually considerably larger than most of what we're thinking of here. So we're, we're talking waveforms that are, you know, 200 nanoseconds or something like that. And, and lightning is very quick, but it's, it's typically a, a little more extensive, like a couple of microseconds, I believe. Um, but we think we've seen it in our data. Uh, we've certainly had events that are very ugly, very noisy that happen, uh, more often than not during thunderstorms that are happening in the distance. Um, so we think that we actually do see radio signals from them. Um, but lightning doesn't transmit its uh, location quite as accurately as airplanes do. So um, it's kind of speculation right now. OK, um, Don Sparks has a question. Have you collected all the data you need for your thesis or do you have another season or two of work up there? Um, I think so. The, the prototype is, is still in existence and I'm, I'm not sure what our long-term plans are, but I think we, we certainly have at least another season or two, um, uh, I hope, with this array. So we, we hope to keep taking good data. Um, for my thesis, um, you know, real life uh, also plays into the amount of data that is enough. Um, and I'm hoping to graduate this summer, so I'm, I'm hoping personally that uh, I don't need more. Um, but I think, I think there is certainly still a cool uh, analysis that can be done with more data. Uh, so the more they take, we, the, the better, for sure. But I think I have enough right now for myself. 
Oh, awesome. Well, shoot, we'll miss you if you don't come this year then. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I hope we do. I think I think um I think we're planning on it. Yeah. Um Noli has another question about possibly like deploying the be beacon out in the Atacama in Chile. Um yeah, I think I think that'd be really cool. Um there are similar experiments. I don't know actually specifically the, the location you're talking about, but I, I've, I've heard of experiments that are in Chile, um, such as OJ is one, if you want to look into it, AUGER. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a cosmic ray experiment that uh, it doesn't use radio waves. It's looking for cosmic rays um, sort of in a more direct impact way. Um, it kind of uses big tanks of water and, and so similar to how you you um, might image Antarctica, they just kind of put water on a mountainside and then when cosmic rays hit it, they can put light sensors in those tanks and detect the cosmic rays that way. Um, so that's a really cool experiment if you want if you want to look into it. Um, I think I think that would be an ideal site for Beacon probably somewhere somewhere in that same mountain range or maybe even using the same sort of um, logistical hub as they do. Um, so that whatever station they're they're working out of. Um, uh, certainly, as I said, it, a full-scale beacon would like to have arrays in as many ranges as we could possibly get, um, and that would be an ideal one. Okay. Um, yeah, it, if I can jump in, I think it would be a cool place if, because what would be nice would be a giant plateau, which you have in the Atacama Desert, and also it has to be high elevation, which Atacama is as well. And so the only tricky part is making sure that you are looking over um, a prominence that is uh, about two kilometers, right? So, so the goal is to get down to basically sea level. Um, and I'm not sure you can do that in the Atacama Desert. We haven't really looked into it yet, but I think it would be a, a great site to check out for sure. And it's, it's definitely one that's been explored for other radio observatories like Dan said. Okay. All right. Do we have any more questions for Dan and Stephanie? I I want to thank you guys for um, coming tonight. I know that it's getting late on the East Coast and in Chicago. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us. We're yeah, happy to talk about it. Thank you very much. Um, this talk is being recorded. Um, it will be posted on our website and our YouTube channel. The, the link on our website will direct you to the YouTube channel. We will be taking a break from hosting lectures in March. And then I am planning on hosting multiple talks in the month of April. And then taking a break until winter time again. Um, yeah, we just really want to thank everybody. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask them or about any other, any other questions about any other upcoming events at the research center. Everyone's thinking, everyone enjoyed your talk. I think John has a question. Right. <laughs> He's raising his hand. Let's see. Sure. Oh, you're still muted, John. Oh, we got double unmuted. I was unmuted for a second. No, yeah. I was just thinking yeah. of college chemistry days where we were introduced, where I was to the uh, neutral particles. And that was a percentage they figured was what intercepting Earth and going clear through the good old planet Earth yeah. without any interaction with anything. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's really cool that they can do that. Um, the fun thing, I mean, as I mentioned, the whole kind of basis of our experiment is that sometimes they do hit the Earth, you know, but most of them can travel yeah. straight through. Um, Luckily, you know, we're looking for these really high energy ones and the higher energy they are, the more likely they are to actually hit the earth. So um, we're hoping that'll help us see more of them. But it's, it's, 
it's cool. I mean, there are experiments like Snow Lab in Canada, which was the one that kind of um, was famous for the solar neutrino problem, which was looking, you know, that's in a in a, a mine, a nickel mine that's two kilometers underground. So it's it's seeing any neutrinos it sees already passed through most of the Earth, you know, well, in depending on the direction it's coming from. <laughs> but mm -hmm. awesome, thank you, John. Yes, and thank, thank you, Stephanie. And also, Stephen left, but um, our operations manager, Stephen Devonzo, helped out a lot this last season with the uh, logistics for the Beacon project. Yeah, I, 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 I wish I uh, had thought to give you guys more credit because I, I mentioned it it's prior. Okay. And I'm no really worries. glad Steph was here to jump in because uh, you guys have been awesome, like uh, truly no incredible worries. to work with. All righty. Well, if nobody else has any questions, I'll let everyone go for the evening. I know, you know, some folks are getting tired. It's East Coast time. So, um, so until next time and um, visit our website, wmrc.edu, and we will have the link to this talk posted. And if that's it, we're good to go and we'll see you later. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks again. Good night.